The word perfect might not have come to mind for everyone who first laid eyes on the cabin as their soon-to-be home. Sure, it might have looked a little run down. Maybe the snow obscured the view. To some, the frozen leg of elk meat thawing by the wood stove might have seemed a bit barbaric. To others, the thought of having to walk like a fox, each step directly in front of the last, to avoid getting stuck in waist-deep snow might have been somewhat of a drag. For me, it was the paradise I had dreamed about for years. Ever since I struck out on my own, I had been migrating towards minimalistic domiciles. First there was the cave, then the abandoned house, next the debris hut, followed by the little trailers tucked away in the woods, not to mention countless campsites and even a few igloos just for variety. Camping in rustic conditions was one thing, roughing it for finite periods of time before returning to civilization and its amenities. But as I tried to survive in these environments on a long-term basis, I began to realize how difficult it was to simply subsist. I'm not sure what launched my quest for self-sufficiency. It could have been my almost neurotic tendencies towards conservation of resources and adversity to waste, not unlike those who lived through the Great Depression. I was, in fact, often accused of being born a hundred years too late. My interest in this life perhaps mirrored my fascination with old-timers, hearing their stories and reaping their knowledge. No doubt, I was compelled to live in closer harmony with the natural world, which inspired me so. I liked how the homesteader life included spending the majority of waking hours each day immersed in physical activity and breathing in the great outdoors. Oddly, I had also been developing a desire to lower the bar of my expectations for comfort. This seemed to be very liberating. Maybe I simply liked the idea of sweating a little to produce my own heat. After all, everyone knows the beauty of firewood is that it warms you up twice. All of these things had been prompting me in the direction of seeking a remote, primitive, and self-sufficient existence for several years. But ultimately, I think it was my craving for the solace of solitude that kept luring me farther and farther away from the bustling world around me, and not entirely coincidentally, to this Rocky Mountain homestead where I now stood. The ranch had all the amenities for which I had been searching. In my other primitive homes, things like food storage, drinking water, heat, and of course bathing and toilet facilities were not so easy to come by. Now there would be no more huddling around Coleman lanterns or dwindling campfires, pretending I was warm on frigid nights, or burying coolers in the ground, struggling to keep food from wasting away in the hot summer months. No. Here there were plenty of pot-bellied stoves for heat and an entire root cellar dedicated to keeping food preserved for a whole year. Instead of my having to filter and boil water, the ranch boasted not only a spring and creek, but also plenty of timber nearby with which to heat it. Icy plunges in creeks were replaced by a luxurious bathhouse, and I even had my very own privy. Most important, I was reunited with my beloved horses. Recent years had led me away from my lifelong equine passion. At last, incessant car repairs would be replaced by a handsome cavy. Here, time was dedicated to such chores as maintaining the herd, gathering firewood, hunting, scrubbing laundry, and hauling every drop of water that was used. I relished the fact that my labors directly translated into my survival. But the best part of the ranch was the folks who homesteaded it. They not only taught me how to survive in that country, but also that self-sufficiency is not so much about what you have to work with as it is learning how to work with what you have. They understood solace, silence, and solitude, and said very wise things, such as, a man with plumbing is a man with worries. As I first witnessed this unique place, there were a few images indelibly etched into my mind's eye. I remember that initial view from the hill as I was approaching on my skis. Speckling the remote mountain valley, there stood a handful of half-buried cabins. Snow drifted around them the way water encircles rocks in a stream. Then there was the sight and smell of Thanksgiving dinner as it was being prepared on the wood cook stove. Our meal was accompanied by the sound of a herd of dogs, rollicking like Santa's reindeer over our heads, having easily made their way up the snowbank and onto the roof. 
and still, I can clearly see the 80-year-old homesteader sitting in that snowshoe weave chair that he made years ago in the cabin he had built with only the help of his horses, sipping cowboy coffee, chewing Copenhagen, and entertaining us all with stories that could have come out of a Zane Grey novel. Next, I made my way down to the snowy meadow where the caretaker had been scattering hay for the herd with a horse-drawn sleigh. I saw steam rising off the creek where it flowed beneath a hole chopped through a foot of ice, the waters apparently warm in comparison to the frigid mountain air. The mist settled into a glimmering crystalline lattice as it froze upon crimson branches of naked willows. There stood the teamster, holding the mighty horses while they buckled their knees to lower their massive heads into the watering hole, balancing on the tips of their hooves like equine elvises. Icicles of sweat and melted snow hung off their shaggy flanks and rattled as they were led across the bridge and into the so-called barn, where I got my first lesson on unharnessing a team. When I made my way back to the cabin, the homesteaders produced a well-worn copy of a Western Horseman magazine from the 80s. It was open to a page filled with images of workhorses pulling turn-of-the-century equipment, 20th, that is, through bountiful stands of hay. There were wheels of steel, frames of wood, a myriad of leather riggings, massive stacks of hay, and cowboys in plaid shirts, leather gloves, and weathered felt hats running the show. The scenes were magnificent, and I asked in awe where the pictures were taken. Well, that's our haying operation, my host exclaimed with pride. I was sold. When asked to stay and take on the role of caretaker for the rest of the winter, I didn't have to think twice. This was just the kind of home and adventure I had been seeking. To stay was the obvious choice, but to stay for 14 years was nothing I could have ever imagined. <laughs>